So, um, hi everyone, my name is Jonathan Pereira, I'm an orthopaedic uh, surgeon from the UK. I trained at that hospital, which is the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital in Stanmore. Uh, this is the kind of stuff we do there, uh, big mega prosthetic implants, uh, and that's mainly because the UK has more money, I think, to spend on them, from what I've learned. Uh, and this is what I do at Mount Sinai, which is essentially just remove it in a soft tissue reconstruction. And actually, I still haven't made my decision about which way I'm going to fall. This one's much more expensive, and when it works, it works very well. The biggest risk for this is the lifelong infection risk. It's a 10% lifelong infection risk, which is massive. Uh, the biggest risk for this is not really much, actually. And once it's healed, you, away they go, and you leave them alone for the rest of their life. So actually, if you get the, this one right, it costs less, and they're good for a lot longer. Uh, and then, in theory, what's left, you could put a hip replacement in there, if you, know, if you knew what you were doing. Uh, so I'm going to talk about malignant bone tumours and soft tissue sarcomas. That's a big topic. Uh, for all those interested, that is a osteosarcoma in the bottom corner. Uh, and that is the WHO classification of malignant bone tumours, of which you can see there are lots. Uh, and they go through the various different types. It's subtyped into the type of tissue. Uh, chondrogenic, osteogenic, fibrogenic, and I'm going to go through a whole lot. I'm not going to talk through all of them because that list is huge. Um, I'm going to talk about probably the ones that I'm not the ones I'm crossing out. I'm going to talk about all the other ones, which are the slightly more obvious ones, and that will be the chondrosarcomas, which you guys see more of, osteosarcomas, which everyone needs to know about, lymphoma myeloma, which again, everyone, can, that's the great mimicker, anything could be a lymphoma. Uh, malignant GCTs, which again is a rare thing but can happen. Chordoma, because that can cause a lot of back kind of sporting odd pelvic pain you can get from that. Um, and then Ewing's, because again that's thing. And Ewing's, yes, is classified as a miscellaneous tumour. So getting rid of all of those, sorry about the formatting, I formatted on a widescreen so it comes out all crazy. Um, so we're going to go through all of those. Not in a huge amount of detail, but in good detail. So a whoops procedure, I'm sure you, everyone knows who this guy is. Um, he's your, oh no, it will come up in a sec. <laughs> the whoops procedure is basically something in the UK that we say, when you say whoops, it's like, oh, it's an accident or it's a mistake. And it's often said as part of an apology, whoops, or oops, I'm sorry. Um, this is, anyone knows who that is, that's Eddie Murphy on the other side. Uh, and that's from coming to America. So I mean, it's in the movies, but no one talks about that too much. They just talk about your <laughs> about your guy. Um, so a whoops procedure is an orthopedic thing where you have assumed a lesion is benign and you've taken it out as a benign lesion, but it's actually a sarcoma or a malignant lesion. It's called a whoops procedure. It's a, I'm allowed to swear on here. Sure. Yeah, it's a bollocks kind of shit. Fuck. Um, I've done something, everyone gets it, okay? And it can happen to anyone. I've seen my friend, most of my mates are oncologists and I've seen it happen to brand new consultants. I've seen it happen to like consultants who are 30 years down the line. It can happen to anybody, but you just have to be able to deal with it in the right way. Bone sarcomas, up to 30% of them referrals are from whoops procedures. And soft tissue sarcomas, two thirds of those referrals up to are from whoops, and that's those are massive numbers. This is just to say this is what happens uh, to treat bone tumor, chemo, surgery, chemo. That's all you need to know about that. Nothing more. You've got a bone tumor, you're going to have chemo, you're going to have surgery, then you're going to have chemo, and that's it. And then you're going to have a long term follow up. It's the simplest treatment protocol in the world. And for soft tissue sarcomas, you need to know what this is, and this is a golf ball. It's coming. Uh, and for soft tissue sarcomas, you need to know what a golf ball is. And the reason why you need to know what a golf ball is, because anything greater than a golf ball, which is 4.2 centimeters or 1.65 inches, is a sarcoma until proven otherwise. No matter what it is, it's a sarcoma. They used to say 5 centimeters, but the actual figure is that, 4.2, which is hence the golf ball analogy. But that doesn't always necessarily marry up, because even smaller lesions can be sarcomas. And we had one the other day that was uh, a guy that had come, he had his sarcoma excision removed, 
and he came and just before we were about to do a revision of something on his of his groin, he said, "There's another little lesion on my on my dermis, on my skin, in my shin, and it was about five or six millimeters big." And we were like, "Okay, we'll take it out for you." And it was a sarcoma, a metastasis. Um, so these again, these are the ones I'm going to talk about. One I'm going to primarily talk about initially is chondrosarcoma, of which there are many. You'll see on the next slide, there are many, many different types of all these sarcomas. So that list at the beginning gets bigger, and then you go down to the both ones, and it gets a bigger list, and then again and again and again. So it's not the easiest subject, and it's not the smallest subject. The most important thing is the second most common primary bone tumor, chondrosarcoma, because in a slightly older age group, and it's more axial in its location. The most common places, again, relevant for you guys, is it's around the pelvis, so the red areas, essentially. Ribs, pelvis, hip. Those are the primary locations. Proximal humerus, like 9% up there. Slightly more men to women, and then kind of middle-agey. So it's fairly balanced, and essentially anyone. They've probably been there a long time and they've converted from either an enchondroma or something else to a chondrosarcoma with time. If everyone lived forever and, and then they had an enchondroma, every enchondroma in that body would convert to chondrosarcoma eventually. Depends on their genetics and their kind of epigenetics how long that's going to take. If it's going to take 200 years, it doesn't matter because you'll be dead before then. But if it takes five years, it doesn't matter because that's the issue. And that's why that's what we don't know. That's the bit we don't actually have the understanding for. Imaging is <coughs> useful, as I said, it's axial. You need to look, as Ahmed, Dr. Aoud was saying, you need to look for the endosial erosions, the punctate calcifications, all those kind of cortical expansion things. Those are the things that, when you see and what looks like an enchondrome, when you have those things, then you're going to be more worried. Hence, staging, local and systemic. MRI, 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 I can't say how important that is. CT chest, if you're gonna really work them up because you'll need to look for METs, and then a whole body scan, a whole, whole body bone scan because you're looking for other lesions. Um, the other problem with that, which also Dr. Aoud was talking about, is it can, you can get a significant number of false negatives. Uh, histo, I'm gonna skip over that because you don't look down microscopes. Uh, management of chondrosarcoma, it's the surgeon's disease. Chemotherapy doesn't work, radiotherapy doesn't work. There are certain types of chemo and radiotherapy we use, but it's more for palliation. And it's more to try and give the patient some hope to some extent, but they have some effort in working, but it doesn't really work very well. So essentially it's a surgeon's disease. Grade one, uh, in, uh, inside the bone is curatage. If it's outside the bone, then it's a wide resection. And anything higher than that, which is grade two or three, and something called D diffusion, when you have two different types of tumor in the same area, is a wide resection and reconstruction. So there's another, there's an X-ray coming. You can see there's a lesion uh, in and around the pelvis on the right-hand side. You'll see it in a minute when it comes up. Um, there it is. So you can see there that lesion in and around the pelvis on the inner table. And then there's a lateral that comes after that. Then after that, you'll see the MRI axial slice T1 and T2. Then there'll be a enchondromatous type lesion with cortical expansion of the proximal humerus. So again, proximal humerus is a really common place because that's a massive sports injury place. Because you're always going to get patients who've got a painful shoulder. And you can see the imaging. I'll go cycle through those. And you can have a look at those. And again, it's that endostral scalloping. You can see on the MRI and the uh, coronal slice, you can see that spilling out of the tumor outside, and that was a de-differentiated, and that was actually what we ended up doing. You'll, you'll get to that in a minute. So they had a wide, they had, there was a D-diff chondrosarcoma, and they had a wide resection with reconstruction, and you'll see it's not the nicest thing that they end up with. So their function is poor, and essentially it's limited to desk-based stuff. Uh, that's another big one. I'm just going to show you again. That's the Sinai way is soft tissue reconstruction. And they do very, very well, these patients. Uh, Ahmed talked to you about Mafuchi's and Ollier's disease, so I'm not going to spend too much time about that. The malignant potential of Ollier's and Mafuchi's. In Ollier's, it's 25 to 30% across a lifetime. In Mafuchi's, which is en enchondromas and uh, vascular abnormalities, 
there's a 100% lifetime risk that they'll get chondrosarcoma. So they are guaranteed, if they've got Mafuchis, to get chondrosarcoma at some point in their life. Which is a pretty harsh diagnosis, but 30% is still pretty high if you've got oleases. And you can get oleases in certain aspects. You could get an oleases in a, in a ray, in like your first ray of your foot or in your first metacarpal. Um, I'm going to move on to osteosarcoma because that's the most common uh, malignant bone tumor. It's 30% of the primary bone tumors are those. It's normally around the knee, distal femur, proximal tibia. It's almost always a soft tissue mass. You get all the abnormal x-ray findings that people talk about, periosteal reactions, sunburst appearance, uh, and a good amount, 10 to 15 percent, will present with a pathological fracture. It's a bimodal distribution, so the younger patients and the older patients with a sort of lull in the middle age, as you can see in the next graph, which is coming up. There we go. And the most common anatomical location, which is the next slide, uh, is around the knee. 50% of osteosarcomas are either distal femur or proximal tibia. And a significant amount are in the femur. Not that much in the pelvis itself. Still at 10%, and then the rest in the proximal humerus, which is another really common area. Imaging, it's all those things. You get permative, you get osteoid matrix inside the lesion itself, and then you can get malignant periosteal reaction, the Codman's triangle, which you can see on that next x-ray, and a sunburst appearance of the uh, periosteum. You need to do your systemic and local staging, MRI, 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 and if you're MRI, you must MRI the entire bone. So if it's the femur, knee to pelvis. So you have to include the hip joint, the entire femur, and the knee joint. And you can see on that MRI imaging, that just shows you that MRI imaging was in a, incomplete because there's a tumor at the bottom you can just see there's a skip lesion halfway up the diaphragm of the femur on that side, uh, which was incompletely imaged, um, and so they had to go back and then have another scan. They would have a total body scan. In the UK, they get whole body MRIs. Uh, that's more common for Ewing's, and that's Ewing's across Europe. Uh, and then they get high-res CT for their chest, and then you need blood work, including an alkaline phosphatase, because that can show you... Uh, that's kind of can give you a, an outcome if they've got really high outpost of presentation then that's a bad prognostic sign path I'm going to skip again chemo surgery chemo just drum that in because that's all you need to remember about that when patients ask you about it I'm not going to talk about the chemotherapy regimes because there are lots and I'm going to move on to lymphoma Reasonably high, 2 per 5 per 100,000. You get Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's. Hodgkin's tends to be a disease of the older patient, and non-Hodgkin's is a bit like the bimodal distribution of uh, osteosarcoma. Myeloma, which is the other kind of hematological abnormality, is again a bit like um, Hodgkin's. It has a, it's almost a disease of the elderly, again, slightly more men than women. And that's kind of true for most bone tumors, unfortunately. Uh, giant cell tumour, which Ahmed is talking about, is a benign bone tumour, but it is locally aggressive. It also has a 5% chance, uh, I mean a 2% chance of becoming, um, hold on, yeah, 2% chance of becoming, having chest mets, and that's approximately a 1% chance of being malignant, i.e. becoming all over it. Um, because of that risk of chest mets, every patient at Mount Sinai is, has a, a, an x-ray once a year, a chest x-ray, because it's simple, it's easy, and it just removes that risk. Uh, chordoma, it's a notochordal um, tumour. It's normally in the axial skirt uh, midline. The most common are the ones sub, uh, under, the, uh, under the skull and kind of in the coccyx minimal in between so it's like 50 to 50 percent and then the rest well 50 to 30 percent and then the rest in the midline um, and it's again it's about one to four percent of the, the tumors and then the last one i'm going to talk about is ewing's because that's another important one uh, ewing sarcoma is primarily in the first and second decade it's has two aspects there's a bone aspect which is called ewing's and then there's soft tissue only and that's pmet or primitive neuroectodermal tumor is essentially the same type of tumor and they're identical histologically and genetically they're the same and the translocation is T1122 but you don't need to know that. Um, 
epidemiology. It's not quite as high as the 30%, but it's 15% of primary bone malignancies. Again, more common in male, peak incidence in the teens, less common in African or Asian descent. And Asian, in terms of the UK, talking about Asian as in Indian subcontinent, not Asian as in Oriental, which is what, how we would describe it. Uh, present with a mass and constitutional symptoms and generally pain. And that x-ray is not perfect, but you can see the sun, sun rays, spicules. They get onion skinning quite commonly, and they always have large soft tissue masses. You can see that. So that's a, coming up in the next x-ray. There's a proximal femur with a massive soft tissue mass. 50% of diaphyseal, 50% of metaphyseal. Um, and you get, as I said, you get the onion skinning. Those m classically do very, very well after chemo, as in almost shrink away to back to the bone. Uh, the distribution is, again, very similar, ar pelvis around the knee uh, and proximal humerus. Those are the areas of concern, which, again, is very relevant for you guys. So you can say someone with, comes with hip pain, it's a bit abnormal. It's not hard just to do your full examination, but a low, if you're worried and they're in those age groups and, and the history doesn't fit with what they're presenting with, it's not that challenging just to get an MRI because it will tell you the answer. And be very, very scrupulous in looking at the x-ray. Look at the images themselves. I mean, I know sometimes when you get written, given a report because somebody else has looked at it, but if you can see the images, it's so much more important. If you see the images, you, yeah, if you all see the images, and that's perfect. Because, and just be really, really OCD about your look at what you're looking at. And if you think there's something abnormal, just go with your gut, because it's normally right. Um, staging, again, it's similar. A whole body MRI is, this, is the norm in Europe. And we have something called Euro Ewings, which is a standard Ewing protocol across Europe. Um, you don't have that quite yet um, here, or you use a different path. I'm going to skip over because you don't need to know about the rosettes, even though they look pretty. Uh, similar to other bone tumors, chemo surgery, chemo, um, but you can use radiation, especially in ones where you're going to where limb salvage is challenging so you can irradiate and that can help a lot it's, it is a slightly radiation sensitive and again the chemo i'm going to skip over but i'll just show you the pictures of what they can look like pre-chemo and what they can look like post-chemo and the difference in that soft tissue mass so that's a 2t t2 weighted image that's coming up and you've got to see the pre pre image on the left when it comes uh, and the big soft tissue mass and then the post chemo and it's basically disappeared um, you still have to treat that muscle, so you still have to take it out uh, with those healthy cuff of muscle around that lesion, but it just makes it easier. Okay, this is the WHO classification of soft tissue tumors, and they're huge. And each one of those has got about five or six things in, which then again split into another few things, so I'm not going to talk about anything, but this is what I'm going to go back to, because you don't need to know the names of them, you just need to know this, which is coming up in a sec. The golf ball. There it is. <laughs> Anything bigger than that, that's abnormal. Like, why should it be there? It's something the size of a golf ball is huge. Uh, even small things you can have low thresholds for. And most people say, I'll get an ultrasound. An ultrasound is fairly irrelevant at the moment in terms of imaging, I think. The only reason to use an ultrasound is to tell if something's a hemangioma or not, because then it has blood flow. In it. That's the only reason we ever use it. Or they can't have an MRI you might want to have an ultrasound plus or minus a CT scan. MRI will tell you pretty much the diagnosis for most things. The, the, the solid versus liquid component thing, you can kind of get over that with gadolinium and, and, and most good MRI radiologists, most MSK radiologists will be able to tell. We can because we look at them all the time. Uh, and with gadolinium, you'll almost definitely be able to tell rim enhancement and things like that. Um, just be wary, the most common, these are, this is a list of the most common reasons why bone and soft tissue things are misdiagnosed. And this can happen as a, in the soft tissue, misdiagnosis even in less than five centimeters. Soft tissue sarcomas are painless. They've become huge. Like we took one out a couple of days ago, it was like 30 centimeters big, entirely painless. And it's above the fascia, so people think, oh, they're superficial, it's painless. It's nothing, it's a lipoma, but it could be a liposarcoma. 
or a D-dip liposuction, and, and they've got chest mets and you've missed it. Osteomyelitis, GCT, simple bone cyst, song caution, necrosis, cycle, keep spinning. <laughs> yeah? Okay. I'm nearly done. I'm nearly done anyway. We're done in about five seconds. Um, so I'm just going to say the pathologist is your friend. I was going to ask, I didn't know there was no one in here. I was going to ask what this is. Uh, but the next picture is a picture of a perineal biopsy, and you wouldn't be doing that. So why would you, if you don't know how to do a perineal biopsy, why would you do a perineal biopsy? Therefore, if you don't know how to do a sarcoma biopsy, why would you do a biopsy? That was my reasoning for showing this. Um, and this is just what we need to remember. Bone tumour, chemo surgery, chemo, soft tissue sarcoma, suspicion, odd story, MRI, refer. And just be safe because you don't want to be the one, and it ha will happen to everybody. It may even happen to any one of the people in the room. It will happen to me, it might happen to him or him. Someone will make a mistake and it'll get caught out. It's just the nature of the beast. And, and I think <coughs> golf ball size is important also in the depth um, and, and, and the deeper, the more concerning, I think, probably less more than superficial. Yeah, if it's deep to fascia, I mean, that, and even if it's less than the golf ball size, if it's underneath. So if you get them to tense their muscles and you can feel it's under the fascia, then 100% that's a soft camera. You mentioned the uh, cordomas as a preponderance to, to areas, one of the skull, the other one of the So Yeah, so coccyx is about 50% and the base of the skull is around 35%. So, yeah. so, I mean, one of the things we will see is coccyxal Yes. And uh, occasionally, you know, typically a lot of that is essentially 50% is some site, mm. so uh, another 50% is either trauma or essentially high levels of sick. Mm. Um, so we'll end up imaging. How is it easy to pick up on MRI? Oh, cool, you'll yes. see it for sure. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. No, also, so obvious. Yeah, and you can have a, an erectile exam, you can actually feel You'll feel it. You'll feel cool, you know. If you okay. do a rectal and you feel a coccyx, you'll feel a, a mass. A mass yeah. yeah, and just from a spine easy. perspective, so. Uh, MRI, you have to volume to get an MRI. So some patients will have like a acute trauma and a coccyx fracture mm. and have coccyxemia, and then we'll actually do a, a resection of the end of the coccyx. And the MRI is pretty obvious when you have a, when you have a cordoma. And yeah. typically, cordomas will be very large in size before they become symptomatic. Maybe a very large fractures to the cordoma. Yes. Uh, yes, it's been big enough. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the core, it's a core, is it, or is it, is it a bone tumor? Sorry. It's, a, it's a note of cordal tumor, so oh, it's, a, it's okay. a developmental tumor, if that makes sense. But it, it, it is, it's kind of on the bone and in the bone itself, so you have to, do that to, you have to take the sacral out. Yeah, yeah. like it wounds the bone. Yeah, it's a very, it's a horrible, horrible operation, yeah. and they're very, very, mm -hmm. very rare. Okay. It's not one in a million, if I remember correctly, in America. Right. Okay. It's a stats. You tend to, do it after the procedure, do they tend to lose? You have to do vocal remuneration or whatever. Or cordomas. Yeah. So if you do it, say correctly, it depends on the level. Uh -huh. uh, the You want to try and keep the S1 and 2 nerve roots because that will give you some function. You want to try and keep it on one side. If you can keep S1 and 2 on one side of the sacrum, then they should have some bowel and bladder function. Uh -huh. Almost definitely they'll lose sexual function. They'll definitely have numbness from all those other areas. Um, but if you're going to lose that, then you may as well give them an early, early on conduit and a stoma, because that's the easiest way to do it. And then you'll need plastics to cover the, the defect. Of that. Big, big surgery. Massive, massive. Two, three cup. days. Yeah. yeah. Stage. I have one patient who had that very young patient. Is that typically the age? No, the age is, I think, the age is, I think middle age again is the average. It's yeah. a little bit like Contrasop, so the peak is around 30 to 40. Yeah, and then there's a smaller peak later on. Okay. I don't have to go through the second. Um, so osteoidosis is the only thing you can do. Mm, um, yes. But um, to, again, the take home for everyone, the yeah. learning point is uh, neck pain with uh, mm. the big So it's one of the things you want to ask in the uh, And a uh, uh, CT. Yeah. Because you'll see the high, you have to specifically ask for fine cut CT, otherwise, you'll miss the nitis. Yeah. And treatment is radio frequency ablation. Except? We're doing some high uh, tickets. Mm. Uh, so we've got uh, another guy with uh, cases that I've sent four patients now to my formal uh, IRF uh, sequence. So we 
high frequency all the time. Yeah, that's what we were talking about the other day. Yeah, because there's even in the uh, neurosurgery uh, tumor base, it's becoming very uh, popular and creating good margins prior to the surgical reception. Mm. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank I'll you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.